B. Riley. All right, this thing's gotten a lot of attention, uh, absolutely annihilated over the last year. Uh, it's been a really pretty interesting 10, five-year run, whatever, um, maybe a COVID beneficiary, whatever. But uh, the shorts are, are really talking about it. And so I started writing a post to talk about uh, the actual company and what they do and some other things and the filings. Um, I've followed the story for a long time, uh, probably since about 2016, um, have owned it off and on and have been buying some shares recently. Uh, so I figured I would just dig in and see, I mean, a, if there's any merit to the, to the short thesis and B, um, just to find out what's actually, what's actually going on. So I started drafting some, some notes, um, and I'm actually just going to walk through it as I as I finish this up and probably just review the 10 K, uh, review the 10 Q and, and look at a couple of numbers, um, as I, as I write this. So I'm going to start by digging into the 10 Q. I think that makes the most sense. Um, really, <laughs> I, I, you know, I've seen a lot of the, the short commentary, Riley's a fraud, uh, if they're not a fraud, they're degenerates. Brian Kahn is a fraud, and that may actually be true. Uh, and by association, so is Brian Riley. Uh, Brian Riley's got a margin loan. I think that's I think that's true. I think that was underwritten in 2019. So I don't know. I don't know what shares were at back then. Um, yeah, probably about this. Probably about this price. Uh, so Brian Riley's got a margin loan and, and yes, he has stopped buying stock. Yeah. So here's, here's Brian Riley's insider buying and, and yes, he has, he, the well has dried up what's been consistent monthly repurchases. Uh, he hasn't made an insider buy since August. Uh, so he's got a margin loan and, and really, I think the core arguments that I've seen are that the investments that Riley has made, whether equity or debt, are just crummy businesses. They're worthless or or fraudulent or whatever. You know the whole the whole fraudulent conveyance of franchise group to B. Riley. You know I, I don't know piecing it together, but let's let's take a look. I think the comments on the short side have really centered around Babcock and Wilcox B. W. Uh, BB stores to a lesser extent. That's BB, um, a stock that I really like actually, and and more recently is Franchise Group FRG. That's the Brian Kahn company, uh, and Brian Kahn is is I don't think he's officially been sued for 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 fraud or securities fraud or whatever, uh, but he's been named or well, called out, whatever, however you want to define it. So. Um, so I started writing this post and I thought, okay, maybe I'll actually start with the operating businesses because I think the best place for me is to understand, you know, B. Riley actually owns some stuff, right? What do they own? Is it actually, is it actually decent? Is it performing? Whatever. I mean, forget the investment portfolio because basically B. Riley is two things. <clears throat> it's, an, it's a collection of operating companies that they own and it's an investment portfolio of stocks, bonds, and some other stuff, uh, stocks, bonds, loans, and some other stuff. And, and both of those things, both the operating companies and the investment portfolio are levered, uh, and, and mainly levered with baby bonds, but let's start with the operating businesses. So this is a look at the segment financials for the operating businesses dating back to 2014. They've changed some segments along the way, pulled some things out of capital markets and put it into, put it into the appraisal business. Um, but more or less, this is what things have looked like going back to 2014. So started mostly as this liquidation business plus their um, investment banking brokerage company and has morphed into uh, some wholly owned companies since then. So there are six segments today, six segments. Capital markets, wealth management, liquidation, consulting, financial consulting, communications, and consumer. Uh, okay, wrote about those here, and and the things that jump out to me. I actually really love this appraisal business. So what they do is they they do appraisals for banks or other lenders or capital providers to 
substantiate like inventory value, equipment value, maybe even business value, whatever, uh, kind of like fairness opinion type business. Um, but, but really to back like both transactions and just like, uh, lines of credit, right? So if I've got a line of credit and my main asset is, is inventory, then, then someone's got to value that inventory. So that business has been super steady for years and years and years. Um, they've added some stuff along the way to do like, I don't know, bankruptcy and, and restructuring advisory and some other financial advisory services, but, but that's a pretty good business. I mean, if you were to sum of the parts, this thing, that thing would be worth, would be worth over 10 X EBIT for sure. Um, principal investments is now called, uh, the communication segment. So that's just a roll up of like these crummy DSL, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, Ethernet based internet companies like United Online and Magic Jack. And, uh, they've done a couple of others since then. <clears throat> it definitely would be a low multiple company if it stood on its own, but it's generated a bunch of cash and, and, and they've actually done an okay job of just continuing to ring out cash. This is an EBIT number. There's some, uh, uh, deal amortization in there too. So I, you know, I haven't included that. This is actually like gap EBIT right here that we're looking at. Um, and the brand's business is probably worth a lot of money too. So they, the brand's business is super interesting. So, uh, here's the 10 K here's the 10 K let's, let's zoom this in. Let's do, there we go. Okay. Now we can actually see this. So uh, here's where they talk about the segments. The brand's business is pretty interesting. So that's now sitting inside the consumer segment because they bought targets and yeah, they bought targets from a board member. They paid, I don't know, five and a half times EBITDA, something like that, 250 million for 55 million in EBITDA. And, and, and yeah, that may fall short, but who cares? Let's, let's talk about the brand's business for a second. So the brand's business, um, a brand's portfolio, uh, generates a licensing income. So like hundred percent margin business, they don't really do much work other than license the actual brand. Uh, mainly to one operator who's a pretty good operator. Uh, they hold a majority ownership <clears throat> in BR Brands, and BR Brands owns six brands, these ones right here. Okay. And on top of that, they also own large equity stakes, but not majority stakes in Hurley and Justice, which are really, really good brands. And, and those are majority owned by Blue Star Alliance, which is their operating partner that actually helps execute these and drum up the licensing revenue. So they have two pieces here. One, they majority own and they get some licensing income. Uh, and that falls inside the consumer segment income. And then their ownership stakes in Hurley and Justice kick out dividend income. And that dividend, in dividend income is super duper valuable. Uh, let's see. What was that? <clears throat> Yeah, so they're raking in, well, that's just not right. All right, we got a formula issue here. There we go. There we go. Okay, so the dividend income is up to about $45 million a year at the moment. So Hurley and Justice are two huge brands that are doing really, really well. Uh, those two businesses alone are probably worth, I don't know, more, more than 10 X what their, what their dividend income is to be Riley. I don't think they'll want to sell that because they don't have to put in a whole lot of effort to generate that. Um, so, you know, now we actually have in the brand's business, a ton of revenue coming from Targus and, you know, the income hasn't changed because Targus hasn't really generated much yet. That was just closed earlier this year. So I think the the jewel here is the appraisal business, in my opinion. Principal investments now communications is is doing good too and generates cash. Brands generates a bunch of cash. Um, wealth management was brought in. I mean they had a they had a wealth management business within capital markets previously, and then they bought national holdings for nothing, right? Because national holdings had an EV of of zero at the time they bought it. Uh, so they brought in, I don't know, like $200 million of revenue at, at like a zero EV or pretty, pretty close to it. Um, and they had to transition that from a 
mainly commission model to now a uh, fee-based model on AUM. So they're turning it around and it's actually going pretty well. And now that business is like 90% plus fee-based AUM. Um, the capital markets business is really hard to underwrite because in this EBIT line is I, what I've done is I've stripped out all the trading income and, and gains and everything or gains and losses. And that's down here. Right. And uh, what's still left in here, though, is the income they're earning on the loans receivable. And that loans receivable balance has grown a lot over the years. I mean, it's it's still, I don't know, $550 million. They have the Badcock thing where they were collecting Badcock receivables for franchise group, whatever. Um, so I tried to strip that out. There's not a ton of data on it, but you know, it looks like in 2020 and then in 2022, the capital markets business was earning about $125 million, excluding the income from the loan book. So interest from loan book. And yeah, this is capital markets EBIT X loan book. Uh, anyway, I was just trying to solve for that, right? Because I wanted to see if you were to take the capital markets business and just say it's banking, advisory, brokerage, whatever, um, you know, what is that doing? And, and maybe 125 million is the right number. There's 30 million from 2019. You know, they've acquired some stuff along the way. That's really why the revenue has grown substantially over the last couple of years. Um, so anyway, uh, the liquidation business. One last comment. This this one is is really really interesting. Um, super super lumpy. You know they liquidate uh, inventories and assets for for um, retailers or other companies that are that are going out of business, and it's having a having a heyday kind of year right now. Uh, but it can range from <laughs> from zero earnings or negative earnings to big 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 paydays when. Uh, when companies are going out of business. So it's definitely a counter cyclical, counter seasonal type of company. So in all in all, you know, other than the fact that the majority of the earnings come from the, from the banking and brokerage business, they've got a pretty decent collection of companies that they own. So anyway, okay, maybe there's more to dig in there. Uh, next, the investment portfolio. Um, Okay, let's let's look at some let's look at some stuff here. So this is September thirtieth. So we've got two hundred fifty-two million dollars in cash. That's cool because they can probably use that to repay the next tranche of baby bonds that are due. There are where is it? Uh, One point seven billion dollars in uh, bonds that are due. Uh, here's the term loans. Some of those sit at subsidiaries. I'm not really worried about those. We won't talk about those. The, if you're looking at the balance sheet and the equity relative to the assets they have, you kind of have to you kind of have to net down the securities lending business. So uh, you know they they do securities lending on short sales and stuff, and they you know they generate some interest income on that. So there's almost an offsetting asset and liability for the securities lending business. So. You just have to look out for that. It's really not a true six billion dollar balance sheet. Um, okay, so securities. So there's one point two billion dollars of securities uh, on the mostly equity side, and then the loan book is five hundred fifty million dollars at fair value. There's two hundred sixty five million dollars of prepaids, and then everything else. I'm just going to consider working capital. So like AR and other prepaid items offsetting the AP and, and, and whatnot. So, okay, let's, let's look into that. Let's see what's in that. Cash flow statement. Okay. Come down here. What do we got? What do we got? What do we got? Okay. <clears throat> okay. Well, here's a, here's our first interesting table. So, uh, all right, we've got some level three inputs on a lot of equity securities. 
So if there's $1.2 billion of securities, uh, 66 million of those are bonds and uh, 1 billion plus are equities. And of that 1 billion, there's 333 million of level one. So there's a fair value for them and 675 that are level three. So like totally subjective management's making some estimates here. What's interesting is, is we've got a 13F here with only $296 million of, of equity value. And we can, we can see what's in that. All right, so it's mostly Alta equipment, which is done okay. LTG stock price. Okay, up and down. Uh, this is an equipment dealer, like a commercial equipment dealer, like forklifts and stuff. It's actually a pretty decent little company. Uh, what else is in here? What else do we have? Uh, Arena Group is is should be a decent business, but it's not. Babcock, we'll come back to that because I've looked at this one before. Uh, Double Down, I haven't looked at at all, uh, but I think they've done, I think it's done okay. I think this was another SPAC. Maybe that's not okay. Double Down is a big holding. That's what, $34 million. That Q3, um, Here's an interesting one. They've got $14 million of a, one of those 3X inverse S&P 500 ETFs. Nice. Uh, and there's also one for the, <laughs> for the NASDAQ. And yet there's none for the Russell 2000, unfortunately. Uh, okay, there's Synchronos SNCR. That's a company they've actually attempted to take private. And I know that sounds ridiculous, because this thing's just been a piece of shit <laughs> from $6 to 42, 46 cents. Uh, they may actually be onto something with this. Uh, uh, one of the Constellation spinoffs actually just bought a division of theirs and, and uh, for a decent amount of money. And they think that that sale uh, will help get them back to profitability. We'll, we'll, let's take a look at some other stuff. Okay. Uh, so their Synchronoc Transact is, is an interesting situation. Uh, and then the rest of the stuff, I don't, you know, either I don't know, or it probably is, is just not good stuff. This is a really weird 13 F. There's not a lot of stuff in here that I would get super excited about, uh, frankly. So, I think some of these things like phase specifically, they must have just gotten into these situations from from the brokerage side of the business, from the capital markets business, right? So uh, you know, phase, I don't know, they 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 made some like sixty million dollars off of incentive fees for for doing this the phase holding SPAC. Um, so this is probably just like a token amount left on that. So okay, back to this. We got a billion dollars here. We've got, okay, mostly the, the level one stuff accounted for the 675. What's in that 675 of level three stuff? Okay, well, here's some info. So now we see that most of the 675 stuff is marked at 6.8x EBITDA, 0.8x revenue, and a market price of 281. I don't think that helps as much. So, okay, we've got reasonable marks on the portfolio there. Um, what else do we have? We should have some more info. Here we go. Um, <laughs> that's talking about BB. We'll come back to BB. Come back to BB. Where is, where are our Where are our level three holdings? All right. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. This is this is some info. All right. 
So the company owns certain equity securities accounted for under the fair value option. So they, they, they own more than 20%, but they chose not to do the equity, equity method. Uh, so they're setting the price on it. And say what you will on whether that's shady or not. Buffett did the same damn thing when he owned stuff like diversified retail and all those other private holdings that he had in his hedge fund days. So we've got three companies effectively that are treated under this fair value method. One of them is now Franchise Group, <clears throat> which we just bought for $281 million, And that is the number, and that's a 31% equity stake. And for those who can't seem to figure out the math behind it. Let's see, what do they say? Uh, uh, Brian Kahn had 11 million shares at 30 bucks a share. So there's the 330. B. Riley put 281 from their balance sheet into the mix. And then I think they did another, I, I can't remember, what was it, 515 million in total that they did? So 281 minus, okay, so. Okay, so the math doesn't line up perfectly, but it's pretty close to the 30% mark. So they put in 281, there's equity value of something like 900 million. That's a combination of B. Riley's balance sheet at 281, Brian Kahn's rollover equity of 31 of 11 million shares, right? So here, let's see, we got we got the franchise group proxy right here. Let's just pull it up. Let's just pull it up. All right, where is it? Security ownership. Okay, here we go. Brian Kahn had 11.6 million shares. So this was a management buyout. I don't know if anyone else on this table participated. So I'm just using his 11.6. And I think, what was the deal price? 30 bucks, so $350 million. So in my opinion, all the Brian Kahn issues, fraud stuff, whatever, this, this 11 million share block at $30 a share is what he has at stake from those claims. Sure, he may have some of that pledged as loans elsewhere, but he has 11.6 million shares, $350 million-ish rolled over into the new, new co-franchise uh, group company, Freedom VCM, whatever. Okay, so B. Riley owns 281, Brian Kahn owns 350, and then B. Riley syndicated the rest, either through their investors, brokerage, whatever. They sold, they sold the rest to other investors. So other folks own the other, whatever, one third of the company. So that's how it's divvied up. Consider it like a third, a third, a third. Kahn, Riley, other people. Okay, so this just closed. So this is like pretty pretty fresh here. We don't have a lot of information. We definitely don't have info as of as of 930 yet. This is now a private company. We'll come back to Franchise Group in a moment. <clears throat> Next on the level three assets are two brands, right? Or two businesses, sorry. Uh, two of the companies individually greater than 20% investments. The company has a voting interest in each of 41 and 43 respectively. This is, in my opinion, and I don't know that it actually calls it out, are the two brands that they do not control. That's Hurley and Justice uh, within the consumer segment. So these are the businesses that are spitting off dividend income back to Riley. So it looks much like what the BB investment is. Uh, and so we can see the financial results for those. Here's the revenue. Here's the net income. Um, this is a high margin business because it's a licensing income. There's, oh wait, that's, that's, that's a uh, BW. There's not a lot of assets because there aren't a lot of assets. It's just IP. So this uh, Hurley justice setup to me is extremely valuable, extremely valuable. So I don't know, this is probably worth the entire $675 million block of level three assets that they have marked on the books right now, way undervalued in my opinion. Uh, but yeah, it's not readily uh, accessible money. I mean, this is a private investment. <clears throat> okay, the third piece of the level three assets is Babcock and Wilcox, B&W. They own a 31% voting interest. I think they own some preferred stock too, but I, I, I don't, can't, 
completely remember what the case is there. So BW is interesting in that they've been trying to turn this thing around for years. And you know, let's just let's just pull it up. Uh, Babcock Investor Relations. Okay. Nice. Scheduled maintenance. That's not the business that I was even looking for. Okay. Financial reports. Oh, here, invest, events and presentation. Let's do this. Uh, let's see. Does this have the table at the tail end of it? So Babcock is an interesting business. They have a thermal company, which is tied to parts and maintenance for uh, coal plants. And then they have a renewable business, which does both new build projects and parts and maintenance for, uh, you know, renewable oriented uh, utility projects. Uh, here we go. Okay. So, uh, no, it's not the table. There's your total debt at 930, 377,312,000,000 net debt. Here we go. Okay. So this is what they've done over the last three years. So revenue has grown. Um, actual operating income has grown uh, and EBITDA has grown. But I think the problem with the company has been translating that EBITDA into actual free cash. Right, so everything beneath that EBITDA line has not has not translated in a way that's helped the company since then. And so they guided to let's see, I think they're guiding to 2014 at um, at 100 million dollars or so. Uh, where is it? Okay. Yeah, uh, 2024 target of 100 to 110 million, Bright Loop and Climate Bright. So they have some um, carbon capture and hydrogen projects that they're working on that actually look kind of interesting. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a generalist, so I don't really know much about the technology behind it. I, I actually love someone who's more technically adept to, to uh, opine on that, but uh Okay, 85 to 90 million in 2023, 100 to 110 million in 2024. Can they turn it into cash? I think that's the question with this business. Um, I didn't see anything that said they were on the verge of bankruptcy. Um, you know, I kind of read the press release and looked at the results and thought that they're just kind of operating according to their plan but we'll come back to that. I haven't fully fleshed out my thoughts. So anyway, those are the three businesses. You have BW, Franchise Group, which is totally fresh. And then you have these two brands, uh, Hurley and Justice, and those make up $675 million at, at just how they're marked within the securities portfolio. So if there's 1.2 billion of equity securities on the balance sheet, Sorry, 1.2 billion. And here's the here's the actual face value, right? So that's what's on the face of the balance sheet. This 1.2 billion, 38 million is in partnerships, so funds. 66 million are in bonds, and about a billion in equity. Uh, 675 or 700 million of which are those three that we just outlined. So, um, form your own opinion on what those are worth. But I think the 13F. Uh, securities are probably worth, I don't know, ha half of what they're marked at, uh, maybe a little bit better. You know, I, I think some of them are better than others. Like Alta Equipment is a real company. And I think Babcock is a real company. And then of the of the uh, fair value stuff, the 675, in my opinion, both Franchise Group and the brand portfolio are probably worth at least that 675 um, marking, if if not more. I mean, you know, this is nine months um, of 2023, 40 million of, of, of net income and 52 million in net income for the nine months ended last year. Um, you know, 
and and on top of that, they got forty million dollars of dividends this year. So I don't know, mark that up what you will, um, but I don't see how that's worth less than than you know four hundred million dollars to them. Um, okay, so that's the that's the equity portfolio. What was I writing about in the, in the investments? Okay, the three big controversies controversies. Yep, franchise group, Babcock. I have yet to dig into Babcock and read the transcript, et cetera, whatever. BB, I don't even know why we're talking about BB. I think I just saw someone on Twitter complaining about it and got all hot and bothered because I actually really like this stock. But but BB, BB, where's BB? Let's, 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 let's find BB. Is this the 10K or the Q? Now we're in the Q. Okay, BB, here we go. Here's BB. So uh, Manny Mashu founded BB, and and he's old. He's getting old, and he's he's retiring. He owned a whole bunch of stock, and so B Riley just on October 2023, they bought 3.7 million shares from him for 18 and a half million dollars, so five dollars a share. And now they own 76. percent So they're going to consolidate it as of the fourth quarter, and I think that'll be a good good thing for 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 B Riley. It may be a bad thing for, for BB shareholders because I think that means a take under is coming probably at the $5 mark. And I, what is it at now? Is it a $3 stock? It's a $3 stock. It's a $3 stock and a bit of ton of dividends out along the way. They've just funneled all the cash out of there. Uh, where are we at? Where are we at? Okay. So now they own 76%. <clears throat> They'll consolidate. They'll start picking up the net income there. So the big argument was, oh, it's impaired. It's got to be impaired. And at 1231, the carrying value was $40 million for Riley. The fair value was $25 million. So that was based on the, you know, what the stock price was. And, and basically, as of this quarter, they said, okay, now that we own that much and we're about to consolidate it, the carrying value and fair value are one and the same. And that number's $30 million. And I still think... That's super, super undervalued because uh, BB owns another series of brands, uh, BB Stores and Brookstone, um, and they get licensing income from that. And that licensing income it does pr a pretty consistent nine to eleven to twelve million dollars a year. In 100% margin business or 100% margin uh, uh, revenue to BB, uh, so that's their share of it. So call it 11 million dollars a year. Well, they have these tax loss carry forwards, a large NOL position, and to try and soak up those NOLs faster, they went to Buddies. At the time, it was owned by by Franchise Group. And they became a franchisee and bought, I don't know, almost 70 locations of, of Buddies. And Buddies was performing pretty well in 2021 and 2022 um, as, you know, the COVID stimulus was going. Well, then Buddies started generating some losses and, you know, Buddies turned to a loss-making business for BB while the JV distributions from BB and Brookstone were propping it up. So now you have this business that earned, in, uh, in using my math, 75 cents in, in 2021 and 86 cents a share in 2022, a $3 stock, mind you, to 39 cents a share in 2023, while Buddy's franchise locations chipped in a almost $5 million loss. So you have this $11 million income business and a $5 million loot money, you know, loss making business to produce 39 cents a share on a $3 stock. So you're trading at less than eight times earnings on what I would argue are pretty depressed results. I, you know, I don't know when that will turn. So I just threw some rough estimates and said, maybe they'll cut that loss in half in 2024 while the JV income stays consistent. And then in 2025, maybe they get to break even, maybe slight positive earnings and get back to 77 cents a share or or $10 million in overall. I mean, I guess this is really owner earnings is how I'm, how I'm calculating it. Um, but 
but you know they have this thing marked at thirty million dollars right now. So I think those markings are are fair, if not if not extremely light relative to what what that will generate. Plus, this is just two more brands to chip into their brand portfolio. If they ultimately try and sell that brand portfolio, I think that gets a little bit easier and and more valuable down the road. So, so that's BB. I don't know. I I I think it's. I think it's interesting. I think they'll probably take it under, but whatever. Let's see. What if they what if they paid out in dividends along the way? I don't know. It was a it was a great little dividend vehicle since they took over, which was in this I think this twenty eighteen time period is when they came into the picture and distributed most of the cash back to shareholders. Um and, and, you know, then they started buying some stuff to generate some more taxable income. I would have loved if they had bought, you know, some of the other businesses that are, are elsewhere in the complex. So, okay. So those are, I think, are the three most controversial equity investments. The other stuff, I don't think it matters. Like, oops, that's not what I want. You can, we can, we can pull anecdotes all day long about phase clan and, and synchronous and all this other shit but like i don't i don't think it matters i think you could you could cut that in half and I, anyway I, I don't think that that's going to drive results i think there's a couple main things in, and frankly i think they see some of those as fee generating vehicles more than anything else okay so the next big piece though is the loan book and the loan book is actually like pretty hard to figure out um, so what do we have? We have, we have $550 million of loans receivable, $550 million of loans receivable. Okay. And, and best I could, could figure out what we have here. Let's see. Let's actually just pull up the, oh, I don't know why it, gets all blurry like that. Okay. Uh, so here we go. This is a slide from their earnings. So the Badcock receivables, now that they own franchise group, that's essentially going away. There's a $33 million little piece left. And that leaves the rest of their loan book at 50, 515 million. The best I could see, they've been doing these loans since like 2017 or so. Um, you know, lending money to clients at you know, basically, basically like bridge loan type, type setups, right? So this average duration is 2.9 years with rates ranging from seven to 20% and a typical balance of $43 million. Um, so, so, the, so that's the general makeup of it. <clears throat> they disclose some things in the, in the Q and the K around that. Um, kind of have to piece it together and really got to piece it together from like other companies filings too. Uh, so I I'd say it's not the cleanest thing. It'd be nice to have some added disclosure around it, but you know, they do that. And then you got all these other people that are about it. So let's see. Okay. We'll come back to that. Okay, here we go. So loans receivable, fair value, $550 million. Um, the historical cost of the loans is 576. Uh, so principal value, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Uh, loans receivable at fair value or non accrual was 41 million as of uh, 930. So $41 million. I saw someone comment that that's probably core scientific. And I actually think that'd be great because I, I think Core Scientific might be their the best money good investment they've they've got uh, in the book. So really, we can't you know Badcock does almost doesn't even matter anymore at this point. I mean, I know they own FRG, but um, yeah, I don't know that it's worth talking about Badcock that much anymore. So there's some other disclosures down here in the related party section. Uh, so Babcock is not alone in that loan book. 
Arena Group, <clears throat> which they own some equity in, has a $103 million loan receivable balance. Applied Digital uh, has a $5 million loan balance. Uh, that's all paid off. That's all good. By the way, the Phase Clan, the company earned, during 2022, the company earned $42 million of incentive fees and $10 million of underwriting and financial advisory fees. Damn, uh, that's just ridiculous. Uh, maybe that makes them a bucket shop, though. Uh, Targus, there's no loans. The FRG, uh, yeah, the $33 million is what's left. Okay, so this is a related party, this Torticity which is like a like a, a legal resolution financing company. They got a fifteen million dollar loan out, fifteen percent rate due twenty twenty six. I don't know what that's about. No disclosure around who the related party is there. Uh, so okay, <clears throat> I piece together. Here's some here's some situations um, within that within that loan book. Uh, you got to read a group. Uh, Excella is is another company uh, that they have some loans out to, and that company does look like it's it's absolutely on the verge of bankruptcy. Um, Core Scientific is in bankruptcy, so part of that forty two million is dip financing. Part of it is sub debt. I sounds like the dip financing will get repaid, and then the the sub debt will will wind up converting to equity or something as part of the bankruptcy process. Torticity, that's new. That's the $15 million loan to an insider or related party or whatever. And then the applied digital $5 million. So, okay. Those pieces total up to $245 million. Uh, so that's, I don't know, like half of the half of the loan book that's on there. So where are we at? So that leaves a whole bunch of other pieces inside that 515, I guess, technically 527, um, uh, that are unaccounted for with, with pretty limited disclosure. But, you know, I don't know if, if, uh, if Goldman Sachs has a, has a loan book, you know, they're not necessarily disclosing the names, balances and financial condition of all their, their constituents either. So you kind of just have to trust the financial performance of that, which maybe that's looped into this trading gains and losses they've had over the years. Um, let's zoom this in. So, okay, dating back to 2018, fiscal 18, um, which is when they started disclosing those. You know, we've got cumulative, cumulative uh, gains of 200 million. That's both in the, uh, in the loan book and the, in the equity book, but that ignores the interest income uh, from the loan, from the loan portfolio. So I don't know, I guess on the whole, it's been okay for them for the last five or six years, uh, financial wise. So, so, so what's happened, you know, I mean, it's just, they've, I think they've levered up too far, too fast, right? So interest expense went from less than a million dollars a year to almost $180 million over the last 12 months. Um, and, you know, I think they've just, they've extended the balance sheet substantially, um, during that time frame. So, all right, that's incomplete thoughts. Maybe I'll piece some more together and make a part two video. But, uh, I think the takeaway is there are some question marks in the investment portfolio. I actually like many of the businesses that they own. And, and originally one of the things I liked is, you know, they have these, these bits and pieces that feed off of each other. So if you're doing the liquidation business and you're doing the appraisal business and you know what the inventory is worth and what the brand is worth, and you're doing that work to generate income and you have first bite at the apple to potentially, to potentially acquire that brand and fold it into, you know, their former principal segments or principal investments segment. Um, that's pretty interesting acquisition deal flow. That's just unique to them. So I, I liked the model that they were building and maybe they just got ahead of the skis on the investment side. So if they had stuck to the 
operating businesses, maybe they wouldn't be, maybe they wouldn't be fighting the battle they're fighting today. Uh, so anyway, okay, we'll cover more later.